Okay guys, welcome back. So as discussed, we were finishing up that second video. We had a little angle on uh, piano, a little bit of an introduction. We'll just launch in, all right? Our title, piano, as we said, very much a literal, tangible object, and we'll see how Lawrence uses it. So again, I'll read through the poem with us. Uh, what I might do is I might dissect it as we go here rather than just reading it all the way through like the last two, um, just because, again, we'll try and get two or three poems done within this video, okay? So, softly, in the dusk, a woman is singing to me. Now again, straight away, we have that sibilance being used there. It creates this dreamy atmosphere of softly and singing. Immediately we're into it with these euphonous tones, okay? Euphonous and cacophonous we spoke about before. Any musical students at home will know exactly what I mean, but we have those soft, um, very much magical uh, tones leading us into the poem. Softly in the dusk, add that in as well. A woman is singing to me, taking me back down the vista of years. Just a side note about dusk, twilight, sunrise, morning. They are very much transitional periods in the day. Dusk here, again, going into night time, again, links in with that dreamy elements of the sibilance being used at the start, okay? Again, if you're sitting at home going, what absolute utter nonsense, that's how we look at poetry. Those are the little one-liners we should be using within our answer, right? Responding using that terminology. Taking me back down the vista of years till I see a child. Now, very much Inception-esque here. The child is Lawrence himself. Very confessional, all right? Very revealing, emotionally honest poetry here. A child sitting under the piano in the boom of the tingling strings. Nice use of assonance there, our eye sound and pressing the small, poised feet of a mother who smiles as she sings. Now, the adjectives being used there, the small feet, these are all, again, very much endearing little pieces of information that is given to us by Lawrence, remembering his mother fondly. That little aspect there of smiles as she sings, is a beautiful little one-liner, okay? Because again, if you are ever singing, I'm not gonna break into song now, but if you are ever singing and you start to smile when you sing, it actually changes the tone, it changes the aural quality, qualities, the auditory qualities of what you're hearing, okay? So, very sensuous, very aural, very, very nice way to end our first stanza. Huge amount of sentiment behind that, okay? In our second stanza, in spite of myself, the insidious mastery of song betrays me back. Now that's a very, very oxymoronic angle there, very contrasting idea, because what we're getting here is a beautiful memory, very nostalgic, and yet Lawrence describes it as being insidious. A lot of us would be familiar with the term because of the, the franchise, the movie franchise, Insidious. That's something that has negative connotations and it worms its way in and grows and it grows. The way he presents it here is the reason why it's so negative is because it actually, we'll see it later, it betrays his manhood. That he again starts weeping and starts crying and bemoaning the loss of his mother. So, it betrays me back um, till the heart of me weeps to belong to the Sunday evenings at home. And Sunday evenings at home, very poignant, very relatable as well for a lot of us. You know, certainly when you get older as well, Sunday evening becomes family time becomes the time that you spend together, okay? So to the Sunday evenings at home with winter outside and hymns in the cozy parlor. The winter outside there is interesting. It's almost like reverse pathetic fallacy. It's like when the weather outside is terrible and yet you are safe and comfortable in the confines of your own home. What it does, it serves to highlight how cozy, to use his vernacular, to use his language, how cozy this image is, this vignette from his life, okay? The tinkling piano, our guide, very aural, onomatopoeia there as well. If you have, let me get a marker real quick. Um, onomatopoeia, you heard me talk about euphony and cacophony there a second ago. These are two terms to help you define onomatopoeia. So, if we can all see that, that is how we correctly spell onomatopoeia. Again, I feel like another pub quiz question, all right? Break it down if you need to, but again, let's not misspell that. Onomatopoeia, euphony, cacophony, all real white flags for examiners. Wow, the students have had a great ability to dissect the language, understand the aural qualities. However, you misspell it, red flag. It tells us that you're about a 60% or a 50-60%, okay? So, correct spelling, all right? Final stanza, 
So now, it is in vain for the singer to burst into clamour with the great black piano appassionato. Appassionato there is basically an Italian term which used to be told to uh, individuals playing musical instruments to give it more passion and now it actually defines kind of a musical style. So appassionato there, very very nice language being used. The glamour of childish days is upon me. My manhood is cast down in the flood of remembrance. Now, my manhood cast down in the flood of remembrance, the flood, flood of tears, the manhood element, the way Lawrence presents it. Different time, guys, all right? War time, the fact that this individual openly weeping here, bemoaning the loss of his mother. Again, he says that it takes away from his manhood. I weep like a child for the past and I weep like a child for the past there. That simile sums it up, that there is this nostalgic moment that is brought about by the auditory tones of the piano. It brings him right back to a vignette in his life. And yet what you get there at the end is you get him being deeply upset, bemoaning the loss of his mother and looking retrospectively at the past and, and happier times. So it's a very interesting poem in terms of mood and tone they tend to change, they're very fluid throughout. Thematically speaking, as discussed, we're very much talking about his mother and the loss of his mother who died when he was 25 um, to cancer. And again, this is the individual that introduced him to liter literature and, and literal aspects. So again, very interesting poem in that regard. We need to empathize, we need to sympathize with the speaker here because it's incredibly emotionally honest. Tone and mood, we've had a little look at there and hopefully thematically, or sorry, techniques wise, you manage to get a number of techniques from that as well. If we have the notes in front of us, we jump to page 14 and we have a little look. So the key aspects of um, this poem, again, the theme of memory and conflict between past and present. And that's an excellent point as well that I failed to mention there a second ago. The contrast between past and present, the contrast between child, um, child Lawrence and adult Lawrence as well, and a longing, a sense of longing to go back. And that's one way that we are going to link piano with calling to death, that sense of longing as well. The nostalgia, okay, the imagery between child and mother, very relatable, um, very identifiable, okay, very, very personal. And as we said, the symbolism attached to the piano there as well. Okay, so that's guys, again, that's a very, very interesting poem that we're going to use. Um, as I said, potentially starting off, whatever way you want to frame your essays, again, as we said in video four, we'll talk about linking again a little bit in greater detail about how we can potentially link these poems and bring them together. Whether you like to start with a little bit of positivity from a chronological aspect, you might mention piano first and then lead into calling to death secondly as well. All right, hopefully that's been quite transparent, you've taken a couple of things from that. If we launch into calling to death straight away without any kind of lag time, which is on page 10 of the notes, I will kind of give you the five to 10 seconds to start Googling it now, guys. That's the name of the poem, that's the nature of the poem, call into death, have a little Google, find it in your poetry books now. As I said, page 10 for our academy um, students, okay? And without even saying anything, when you come across a title like this, because it's very possible, maybe even probable, that you might get something that has evocative, shocking language like this, death being a superlative, there is nothing greater than life and death. If you don't know what a superlative is, it's the most extreme version of a word you can use. So again, in terms of call into death, very much striking, very much evocative title straight away. Okay, if we look at page 10, again, contextually speaking, we're talking about Lydia, we're talking about the mother again here, and the sad passing at a very, very early age. We're talking about Lawrence as a 25 year old. This poem, guys, the fact that it deals with the same relationship element, the same kind of um, subject matter, is very, very different to piano. Yes, it ends on that kind of somber, very sad note again. This one is far more worrying, all right? We get a speaker here who is deeply struggling with what has happened, okay? If we launch into the poem straight away, call into death, we highlight as our title, as we said, it's evocative, it's striking, okay? Again, what Lawrence does within this, and this is something that you should say, because he's dealing with such significant subject matter, and how significant it is to him, what he elects to do is reject poetic language. And he dives into it. We have a conventional structure poem, yes, but he doesn't worry about poetic language. He just says, look, here is how I'm feeling. This is my heart and I'm putting on paper for all to read, okay? These are the little one-liners that we should be saying. 
Since I lost you, my darling, straight away, immediately you're in, evocative. Since I lost you, sense of loss, a sense of longing for, a sense of regret potentially. My darling, the sky has come near and I am of it. The small sharp stars are quite near. Again, talk about maybe heavenly aspects. We're talking about a much more kind of religious time, okay? Now living in a much more secular age. Very religious here, the concept of religion potentially being more significant then. Sky coming near, the sharp stars, that's not positive language, okay? That's again that cacophonous language we spoke about. Are quite near, the white moon going among them like a white bird among snowberries, and the sound of her gently rustling in heaven like a bird I hear. Now there's a couple of things to take from that. That's a much more pleasant image in terms of the white on white, the white moon, uh, the white bird, the snowberries. Far more pleasant, the white on white, more angelic, much more positive. The rustling of the bird, again, very aural, very nice onomatopoeia. However, the fact that this individual can hear the sounds from heaven, again, suggests how potentially how close this afterlife might be and how close maybe the end of his life might be, okay? And I am willing, second stanza, to come to you now, my dear. I'm willing now to come, again, very, very worrying for an individual alive to be talking about an individual who sadly passed on to be talking about, okay, I'm ready. Well, then there's, there's a very much a significance of weightiness to that. As a pigeon lets itself off from a cathedral dome to be lost in the haze of the sky, I would like to come and be lost out of sight with you like a melting foam. Now, again, very interesting similes here. Lawrence effectively starts talking about a bird jumping off a cathedral dome, religious iconography, religious connotations there as well, the dome of a cathedral, very much religious, but effectively jumping off, the, uh, jumping off this dome here, losing sight of where it's at, and then crashing down to earth, effectively dying. And he makes the point here that that pigeon, he is effectively the, the same, in the same position. He says here, I would like to come to you and be lost out of sight with you. And when you're lost out of sight, Again, we get very serious connotations there to be passing on and to be out of sight, dead, okay? Third and final stanza, for I am tired. Now guys, tired is probably arguably one of the words I would use potentially the most within my day-to-day -day life. I'm tired, yeah, I'm tired here, whatever. Didn't get much sleep, I'm wrecked, I'm tired. When you get that in print, and when you get a poet talking about that, considering that we've got so much connotations about life and death, I am tired is very worrying, okay? It suggests uh, uh, almost that they've given up, all right? They have had enough, that they are tired, okay? My dear, and if I could lift my feet, if I could lift my feet, if I could, vocab choice, significance of the language there, the tactile elements, the weight, the heaviness, what this individual feels. My tenacious feet from off the dome of the earth, we go back, He's linked very clearly, mastery of language there, linking the repetition of the dome, the pigeon himself, the dome of the earth, to fall like a breath within the breathing wind, where you are lost, what rest, my love, what rest, exclamation point. The repetition of what rest there, the consonants which we spoke about as well today, guys, what rest gives it a finality, that T sound, the stopping, Okay, what rest, my love, what rest. Now, ironically, call into death, deeply negative, negative connotations, and yet, with that sense of finality, there's actually a positivity. In, in a weird juxtaposition, there's a positivity at the end there that Lauren's looking for this rest, looking to be reunited with his mother. That actually, in a weird kind of twist, we get a positive ending to call into death. And piano, which started so positively with that beautiful nostalgic vignette, we actually end that on a little bit of a negative. Plus, positive, minus negative. This is another really, really good way, guys, that you should link your poems together. If it's a case that you can take two that clearly have same subject matter, same thematic angles, but you can show how the poet talks about this particular area of focus, whilst at the same time showing the differences between the two, either stylistically or maybe the ending or beginning of the poem, that's a phenomenal thing to be able to talk about in an answer. And if you could do something like that, that would work really, really well. Okay, piano, positive changing into negative, call into death, 
negative changing into potentially positive. Again, it's totally interpretive, guys, whatever way you want to look at it. But again, two poems very much dealing with the loss of the mother. That poem there, again, thematically speaking, as discussed, tone and mood, you have that juxtaposition. It's very upsetting, it's very worrying. We should deal with it as such. Okay, the tone and mood are very clearly linked. The tone of how it's put across is that lethargy, that overbearing tiredness, almost that this individual is fed up and he longs for um, um, a, recon, uh, re or I suppose a reconnection with the mother. Okay, so theme, tone, and hopefully, guys, we got those techniques down, the techniques that we needed to get, all right? So that's four of our six poems. What we're gonna do is we're gonna launch into uh, yet another poem with regards to um, Lawrence, our fifth out of our six, what we might do is we'll have a quick look at page uh, 26 of the notes, and we're gonna look at a poem called Hummingbird. So what I'll, again, I'll pause, have a little look for the poem itself. Again, if we feel that the, the pace, the dissection of the class is a little bit too fast, especially if you've never sat in a day school class or a grind school class, you might be scrambling a little bit. It's the beauty of the video, guys, pause, rewind, listen to it again, and challenge the material. If you feel, well, that's not my interpretation, that's okay, it's poetry, it's supposed to be subjective. But what I would do is look to the information. A lot of this information will come from extended reading, will come from extra little passages here and there. Again, just use it either to bolster your answer or use it to challenge as well. Say that scholars, and in no way am I claiming to be a scholar, but scholars have discussed this, or some of the critics of Lawrence's poetry has said this. However, I feel, and that's a really nice way, nice angle to take when you're looking at poetry as well. Okay, guys, we are on page 26. We're looking at a poem called Hummingbird. You're gonna find that there. Take, again, the five to 10 seconds that you need to Google it. Take the five to 10 seconds that you need to find it in your poetry books, and we'll pick it up from there. Again, what I would say is feel free to pause, Feel free to, you know, read the poem over two or three minutes and then launch into it. So I'll pause for a second, have a little look, and then we'll come back and discuss it. Everyone back? Right, let's have a little look. So straight away we highlight our title as discussed. Every single title needs to be highlighted. Hummingbird immediately gives us visual, gives us uh, aural connotations. All right, we all know what a hummingbird looks like. It's frantic, okay? There's a lot of movement. And that's effectively why Lawrence uses it within this poem. He's talking about, as we have here, life. And in a sense, he goes big and he goes grand with the concept of the beginning of life. But by and large, a lot of interpretive material done on this poem, he's very much talking about creativity and potentially talking about himself and his own creativity, okay? If we look at the poem itself, again, it's incredibly symbolic as discussed, all right? There is that, as we said, with Hummingbird, there's a, a, an excitement and an element of sudden activity, sudden behavior that we look at as we go through with this as well, okay? Um, yeah, let's just dive in, okay? I can imagine in some other world, primeval, a primeval dumb far back in that most awful stillness that gasped and hummed, hummingbirds raced down the avenues. So, gasped and hummed, effectively what Lawrence starts off with is this concept of creation and he's talking about in the very very beginning and yet what he does is a little bit of humor he suggests that hummingbirds and as we'll see a little bit later these big grand hummingbirds hummingbirds have always been there the gasped and hummed is almost a preparation you're almost waiting and we're waiting for existence very much existential this poem very much talking about the beginning okay the gasped and hummed there consonants tactile, aural, very, very sensuous, okay? So, before anything had a soul, when life was a heave of matter, half inanimate, this little bird chipped off in brilliance and went whizzing through the slow, vast, succulent stems. That's a phenomenal stanza there, guys. It's incredible, it's so detailed. It's so, again, there's so much to take from it. Okay, the varying line lengths is one thing that I would jot down about that. Again, it's what Lawrence's mastery of language, how he shapes and molds his poetry, okay? The contrast of language, the slowness of some words versus the speediness and the, the readiness of others. Heave of matter, talking about that grand movement of mass, again, Big Bang-esque, okay? This little bird chirped, uh, chirped off in brilliance, all right? 
So Chirp Dolphin, brilliance there again, very much aural, very much onomatopoeic there as well, and went whizzing onomatopoeic through the slow, vast, succulent stems. And again, what's presented to us here is the avenues of life and how basically the creation is happening and these birds whizzing around, going to and from. Okay, that's two stanzas into a five stanza poem, guys. What we're going to do is stop there. We're going to pick this up in video four. We're going to box off this poem. We're going to move on to Bavarian Gentians. And then we're going to potentially talk about, as I said, an essay title. And we'll go from there. Okay, I'll see you guys in lesson four.